I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. It's a real pleasure to have Congressman Ted Poe to talk about his uh, Foreign Assistance Transparency uh, and Effectiveness Act. Uh, it's one, uh, 390 votes to zero. How many times have you heard of a Foreign Assistance Act that has passed 390 votes to zero? He's tapped into something very deep and very important um, in the international assistance um, world. And so I think uh, we're very fortunate to have him come speak, and then we're going to have a panel discussion after. We're going to start the discussion now, the conversation now, because uh, Congressman Poe may be called to, to votes up on the Hill at any moment. So I'm going to ask Congressman Poe to come up. Congressman Poe from Texas, please come on up. Well, thank you, Dan. Appreciate it very much. And I think, appreciate all y'all being here. Uh, just so it's clear, because I can see that some of you are not from Texas. Uh, y'all is singular. Therefore, all y'all is plural, and now you, now you know. Uh, but uh, I appreciate the chance to be here, and uh, I appreciate our panelists that are getting ready to give you some expertise in this issue of foreign assistance. Uh, when you mention the word, phrase, foreign aid, a lot of Americans kind of bow their back, cross their arms, and they don't get warm fuzzies inside. <laughs> they don't. It's been that way forever. It's not just a recent phenomenon. When I was a kid, I would hear about foreign aid, believe it or not. And, and people would, would have a reaction that wasn't very good. And we would talk about how much money we spend in foreign aid. You know, in the big budget that we pass or the money we spend every year, foreign assistance is just 1%. It's not much. And you don't get that reaction for, for other things that government spends money on, except foreign aid. Um, and I don't know that we're going to be able to change that uh, perception by a lot of Americans or not, but uh, we have to deal with that as really a reality for a lot of people. Last night I did a telephone town hall, several thousand people on the phone. Uh, we're talking about the Ukraine and, and what we're trying to do to help uh, in that situation. And the callers, a lot of them were talking about just foreign aid, you know, not in favor of it is what I'm trying to say. So uh, that's a reality that foreign assistance has to deal with that other types of aid, money that government spends doesn't have to deal with for some reason. Uh, so one thing we can do to, uh, to promote the concept of uh, a foreign assistance, I say we, all of us in this room, is to monitor the money that is spent by American taxpayers it's to see uh, where it is spent. Um, I've been working on this legislation for uh, a while, and it's, uh, this legislation is bi <clears throat> bipartisan. Uh, you hear a lot about the, you know, the gridlock, nothing, no one cooperates or anything else uh, over in the uh, Congress, uh, uh, but this is bipartisan legislation. And uh, Representative Connolly and myself are, are the sponsors of the current legislation. It passed the last Congress in the House 390 to zero. I mean, there wasn't one no vote of anybody that voted. And you, from the far right to the far left, anybody, all 390 that voted, voted for the legislation. Why isn't it the law? Well, when we sent it down the hallway to the Senate, the Senate has a rule that one member of the Senate can block legislation. And so that's what happened in uh, uh, the last Congress. We had one, one member exercise uh, his ability to uh, stop the legislation uh, over in the Senate. So we introduced it again uh, this Congress, and we hope we can get a vote in the House and we can get the Senate to approve uh, the legislation as well. Um, but the whole concept is let's see how we're spending our money and evaluate it. Uh, since we've been having foreign assistance, there hasn't really been much of an evaluation of how that money has been spent. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, it, it, we need to monitor how the money goes to different NGOs. Uh, we need to know the good and the bad and the ugly. 
Those programs that are working, well, let's support them. Those programs that aren't working, well, maybe we ought to put our money somewhere else. Let's just find out and deal with the reality and the truth of foreign assistance uh, and make the changes where we need to make the changes. And all that comes from just evaluation of the programs. I call it an audit. Uh, you can call it whatever you want to of, of foreign assistance. The, um, the nonprofit Publish What You Fund produces the only report, really, that looks at all the foreign aid organizations around the world and compares how transparent they are. In their latest study, the State Department of the United States was listed as poor, or poor, whichever way you want to say it. Not so good. Um, here's why. The United States government has a website where it's supposed to post on the website foreign aid work and how, we're, how our foreign aid is working. The State Department, responsible for that, hasn't posted on the website since 2010. Four years. I mean, the people who post on that web, what are they doing, you know? I don't know. But you would think that we would post what we're doing with foreign aid. And that ruins our credibility. I'm, I'm talking about our credibility, our country's credibility with our citizens and of, and of other countries we try to help, is that we're not posting uh, even the basics of how we're doing with foreign assistance. Um, the State Department has posted what they intend to do in the future. But there's no data from the State Department about how much of it is actually spent on a particular project in a particular nation. Uh, it even has less data, data posted than the secretive Department of Defense. Uh, well, I won't talk about the Department of Defense. This is not the place. But um, uh, after four years of this website's existence, only eight of the 22 federal agencies that are involved in foreign aid have posted any information at all. So why? That's my favorite question. Why? We just don't know. Don't know what the real answer is. They just hadn't got around to it. So uh, we need to know how the money's being spent. We need to know. You need to know. Citizens need to know. NGOs need to know. What's working? What's not working? What's something we can improve on? And um, that's part of the reason why uh, this legislation is being sponsored. Let's just have a look-see, uh, have a little more transparency in government. That's a word, phrase, you know, we've heard a lot about that. Uh, and frankly, we're getting a little pushback from the State Department on this type of legislation. And I ask my question, I ask the same question again. Well, why is that? Doesn't the State Department want to know what the State Department's doing with American money, with NGOs? NGOs that are working, or maybe we should support them more, and NGOs that aren't working. Why? I don't know. I can't give you the answer to that. Um, the, uh, uh, there's some simple things that we can do. For example, those that are carrying out the projects shouldn't be really making the decision as to whether the project is working or not. Um, a USAID country director in charge of all the programs in a given country is also in charge of the evaluations of those programs. That's like a student taking a test and the student grading their own paper. You know, that's what we're doing. Every student would make 100, except maybe some would, would not, but uh, anyway. It, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So why don't we have somebody else evaluating the project to see if it's working so that we can get a true evaluation. Um, and of course, we should uh, figure out to have a baseline on the evaluation. The, in other words, evaluation means different things to different folks. You know, you can just say, well, looks like this is working to me. Oh, it's not so good. What's the baseline? Why well, is the evaluation done? What protocol is used in the evaluation of a project. And um, we need to know which projects are working, which ones are not working, which ones can be improved, and which ones uh, are not going to be improved. 
Now, the Millennium Challenge Corporation is uh, head of most federal agencies when it comes to evaluations that are rigorous evaluations. And uh, uh, even the MCC only completed its first impact evaluation in 2012. Um, USAID, the State Department, and others are even further behind and have, have yet to even do one. So evaluation is important. It is important for, um, for all the reasons I think that we should be transparent about aid. You know, there is no group, there's no country on earth where the people are more giving than Americans. And one way Americans give is through foreign assistance. Let's make sure that that assistance is good assistance, that it's working. It's, if, if, it's, if it's not working, it doesn't help whoever we're trying to help. It sure doesn't help the taxpayer. So it's evaluated. Let's be transparent about what uh, uh, we, we are doing when it comes to uh, uh, foreign assistance. A lot, there's a lot of policies, and the policies are not being implemented. Um, you know, administration, this administration, every administration since foreign aid started has a lot of smart people in the, in the foreign assistance business. And they know we can do it better and they need to give us uh, a, the impact of evaluations and what those evaluations uh, result in. There's a lot said about foreign assistance, that it's great and we're helping folks and all of that. But you know, People are cynical about foreign assistance, as I started out. Uh, my grandfather used to say, uh, when all is said and done, more is said than done. And that's really kind of true. We hear a lot of great things about foreign assistance, but let's look at it and make sure it's evaluated. Instead of just saying it's working, let's evaluate it and make sure that uh, uh, the right NGOs are uh, getting that aid that NGOs that are working, that we improve that, that whole concept with that particular NGO, and those that are not working or not helping whoever we're trying to help, we don't use those folks. Evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. And thank you very much for being here, and I want to thank our experts for being here as well. Foreign Aid Transparency Act. Let's pass it again. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
project and program information to do so on a country by country basis. As he said, evaluation, 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 everything on one place. Um, his bill comes at a time when development dollars um, are and have been and will remain under scrutiny and pressure, not just in the US, but around the world. Uh, those rare donor countries that are increasing assistance, like the UK, have only done so in the context of returns and effectiveness that they're getting. The UK government famously reviewed its multilateral investments um, in 2010 with those criteria in mind, uh, plussing up some uh, multilateral agencies, keeping uh, some multilateral agencies the same, and cutting some entirely out. Um, his, uh, his bill also comes at a time when many middle-income countries uh, have uh, space exploration programs like India, or large dollar reserves like China, or have kicked out donors like Russia. Maybe I think that's definitely for the better, in my opinion. Uh, I'm glad we're out of Russia. Uh, when donors around the world are having to rethink what it means to engage with developing countries in this context, I think it's a much more complicated world than sort of traditional donor and recipient. Um, his bill comes at a time when there is a data revolution that makes information more easily available, but currently not yet available, as, as the congressman said. It comes at a time of the IATI initiative, the, uh, um, the, uh, the Aid Transparency Initiative, a voluntary multi-stakeholder initiative that seeks to improve transparency of aid in order to increase its effectiveness in tackling poverty. They're the folks that do publish what you fund. Uh, it comes after 10 years of the Paris Accra Busan Global Partnership. That's a quite a long title, um, around aid effectiveness and development effectiveness, and uh, the concept of country ownership. So, and the administration is doing what it can under existing law through its evaluation framework at aid, through its uh, foreign assistance dashboard, um, as, but there obviously lacks information, as the congressman was saying, from a number of, of agencies um, in terms of what's, what's up and what's put out um, in the public domain. Uh, it's also uh, at a time when the MCC, is, uh, which was built around country ownership, has been hard at work on a whole exercise around aid effectiveness and feeding that back into its programming. I'm really pleased that Sheila Herling is here from MCC to talk about that. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask my five panelists, you have their bios in front of you. I'm going to just slightly rearrange the jet chairs here on the nameplate, but um, I'm going to ask my friends to come up. Uh, and I'm going to have Ed over here, and I'm going to have... Sheila here. This is like rearranging the deck chair. Now come on up. Okay. Do that. Okay. Okay. So I won't go into long uh, biographical. Uh, detail about each of the folks on this panel, but I think suffice to say that many of you know them and you have their bios in front of you. And I think provide an interesting perspectives on this whole conversation around aid effectiveness and selling assistance and telling the assistance story. I think that's what brought a lot of you to this, to this conversation, invest your late afternoon here, as well as the fact I think this is a very interesting group of panelists. So let me first uh, start with my friend Ed Fox. So Ed, uh, 390 to zero. How many times have you seen a foreign assistance uh, bill uh, get past 390 to zero? Um, you were Assistant Secretary of State for Ledge Affairs. You were Assistant Administrator at AID for Legislative and Public Affairs as well. So you've thought about this from a State Department perspective. You've thought about this from a, an AID perspective. You were on the Hill for a long time. So when you hear, talk about what, what, what the Congressman is tapping into, but then talk about the, how, this, how this plays on the Hill. Thank you very much uh, uh, for having this panel and uh, allowing me to be a part of it. I appreciate it. Um, it's a very difficult subject, which can go into a thousand directions, and trying to keep it straight and narrow is going to be a bit, bit tough. But one of the things that I've found out about foreign assistance in general is trying to get everybody to agree what it is and what it's for and how it ought to be provided. There's a thousand different answers to those very questions. So when you're trying to monitor it and you're trying to sell it to somebody, you're also going to get a lot of different views. And um, what uh, over time, those things do change as the role of foreign aid has changed as an important part of our national security foreign policy. But also the role of Congress and the way they view it 
and uh, the support that you have in the general community for these things changes over time. But the big issue for the State Department and USAID, I think, uh, for a long, long time, is they don't have much of a constituency. And in this town, you need a constituency. Uh, I remember when I was at the State Department uh, uh, up on the hill trying to sell foreign assistance, um, my colleague at the Defense Department had a lot more tools than I did. We'd have a meeting to discuss how you did this, and they would bring a book about this big, and they would open the book open, and it would show congressional districts and states, and it would show the number of soldiers from that area, the number of army installations, the number of manufacturers, the suppliers, the whole chain network of people, and also an estimate of how many jobs and how many tens of millions of dollars that went to that district from the defense budget. And then they would turn to me and say, how do you do it? And I say, well, I uh, you know, try to get you to give your hard-earned taxpayers' dollars to foreign ingrates. And that's about uh, the, the way that it goes. But there is a serious problem there. The American public, and for a long time the Congress, does not have a very good sense of what the constituency elements of this are and why it should be important to them. I will say that... Over time, these things are changing, partly because the importance of this work is changing, both in terms of the uh, scientific aspects. We know more about what foreign aid doesn't do, maybe. We're learning somewhat about what it does do. Uh, so that's an important thing. And as we've seen over the last decade, as foreign assistance has become um, paired with other aspects of our foreign national security, uh, the 3Ds concept, the whole of government concept, those have pushed up the importance of foreign assistance in general and have given it a stronger seat at the table. Having Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton testify together on behalf of the foreign assistance budget was as equally surprising as a vote of 390 to nothing a few years ago. So those are all important aspects. A lot of this goes back into history as well, but uh, I don't know if you want to... Just one more minute. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, there's, there's a lot to be said about this. The, the nature of Congress has changed over time, too. When I started getting involved in this on the Foreign Affairs Committee staff in the 70s, we passed legislation. Every two years, we did an authorization bill. That was your key to power. That was your key to success. If you wanted to be relevant to the process, you had to pass legislation, and we did that. But then uh, later on in the 70s, the country started to change. It was sort of the follow-up to the Vietnam situation. It was sort of the follow-up to Watergate. And there was a whole group of young members of Congress who said, we're not going to wait any longer. We're not going to spend 30 years so I can be chairman of some committee. I want power now. And they broke down the internal workings of the Congress. It had nothing to do with us. It was across the board. They threw out old chairmen, threw out the seniority system. They demanded subcommittee chairmen had more power. But by doing so, you diffused the whole situation. And we got away from having as many bills for a variety of reasons. And pretty soon, we had a situation where the only thing that was relevant were the appropriators. And for years, the appropriators became the dominant focus. And then guess what? Even that blew up, and the Congress for the last several years has been impossible to even get appropriations bills done. Now, that has nothing to do with foreign aid other than the fact that without the Congress, there is no legislation of any kind. So the concept of trying to improve and change from what we've learned has been pretty much impossible because the mechanism that we need to get it done does not work any longer. I remember just a couple, three weeks ago, you had Gary Edson here. Gary is a friend of mine. We worked together at State, and he was a senior White House aide in the Bush administration and was one of the primary movers behind MCC and behind the uh, PEPFAR and things of that nature. And there was a big fight as to where this kind of authority ought to lie. You know, are, should we have one major source like USAID or are we going to have a hundred sources? Uh, the answer was solved very quickly and it had nothing to do with either foreign aid or any of the institutions. It was the fact that the White House did not have the political capital to spend to go to the Hill and fight it out to make it the right answer. 
So you create something new and you move around existing structures. And that's what we have today, sadly, is a paralysis of the situation that uh, doesn't allow us to set foreign aid aside and give a dispassionate discussion about whether it works or doesn't work or how to use it. We can't get to that point because the mechanisms will not allow us to go forward in the evolution of the necessary policy changes to meet the 21st century. Thanks a lot, Ed. Thank you very much. Ambassador Simon, thank you for being with us. You were at AID uh, working on policy planning issues, I think as well thinking about evaluation issues uh, uh, in, a, in a past life. You were uh, at, uh, at the White House, you were at the NSC, you also then were the number two person at OPEC, and then you were ambassador of the African Union, so for the United States. And now you have a, you have a new life uh, working on impact investing, so you think, you've thought about impact and assistance at AID. You've thought about impact and how the U.S. uses its uh, its assistance through OPEC, and then you've also you're you're selling impact now in your in your current day job. So when you when you hear this conversation and you hark back to the various hats you've worn, what what's your reaction to this? Well, thank you, Dan. First off, for this uh, convening this meeting, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak in your wonderful new building or newish building, and to see old friends and colleagues. And I guess I also want to thank you for giving Ed one more minute. I thought that was probably one of the most cogent <laughs> explanations of our current dysfunction in this town. Amen. And I think if more people could understand where this all came from, maybe we'd go uh, some ways towards fixing it. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank, uh, in absentia, Ted Poe. Um, uh, for, I think, you know, putting on a, putting a piece of legislation and explaining it that maybe also goes some way towards solving our dysfunction by focusing on the concrete impacts that we're trying to achieve uh, with impact investment, I, with, uh, with, with foreign development assistance. I'll get to impact investment in a moment. Um, and I think it's a great thing to see the Hill focusing on development aid as a whole as opposed to its little constituent parts, which I think has been another part of our challenge in trying to create a coherent, functional um, development policy for, for this country. I would say, though, that there's another challenge when you think about aid um, as one component of development uh, policy. And I think it is important to recognize that our whole development policy is not just aid, that there's a whole lot of other pillars that we'll talk about in a second. But when you think about aid, at its heart, um, aid involves the imposition of the donor's values on the recipient. Um, we, we, we try and, and, and address that issue in many ways. We can debate whether the donor's values, in fact, uh, are in some way superior to those of the recipient. Uh, that debate's actually happening right now in Africa and places like Nigeria and Uganda. But the one thing we know is that one of the most important factors, and we know this from the development literature, and I think you can, it's, it's, it's a consensus among uh, my, our old colleagues at the Center for Global Development and places like that. Uh, the one thing that we know is that one of the greatest contributors, factors to aid success is local ownership, is country ownership and local ownership. And the act of providing aid and imposing values on the recipient, that very act undermines local ownership. And a lot of the things that have happened over the last 10 years have been out there to try and address this fundamental flaw in development assistance. MCC was created in part to address this issue of a lack of local ownership. The Paris Declaration and the Busan Declaration, the Accra Accords, all those things are about trying to do this. The country coordinating committees that are part of the Global Fund, all these things are measures to that try and address this fundamental flaw. And I would argue that impact investing is also a measure that tries to do that. And I think these things have varying degrees of success in doing so. Um, many of them try and do it from the top down. And what impact investing does is try and address it from the bottom up. So rather than creating a model where you have donor money coming in and says, here's the donor money, and to get this money either explicitly or implicitly, these are the things you have to do, you focus on a transaction, a market transaction. And a market transaction has the, the virtue of being something that all the parties enter into voluntarily. And an impact investment is a market transaction where the parties are not just interested in a financial return, they're also entering it, at least some of the parties, some of the parties may be purely interested in the financial return, but many of the parties, 
particularly the investors, are investing because they also want to see a social return. And those investors can be folks like uh, the Gates Foundation or the Omidyar Network or the Soros Economic Development Fund. They can be folks like my former agency, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or its sister development finance agencies like CDC or Proparco or FMO or IFC. Um, uh, they, they could be foundations that use program-related investment. I think in the future, they could be places like sovereign wealth funds or, or pension funds that see a long-term value in investing in things that A, meet the interests of their constituents, and B, provide a return that's somewhat diversified from the global, global market returns. But of course, part of the idea of impact investing is that you're investing where commercial money won't go. It's not that you're investing in things that are bad investments, but you're investing in a place or a sector that doesn't quite deliver the same risk-adjusted return um, that, that a commercial investment would, be, would, otherwise a commercial investment would be there. So you have to, to find risk mitigants to basically make that investment more attractive. One of the risk mitigants is investors who have a longer time view or, or, or more patient capital and are willing to accept some trade-off on social return to get uh, financial, uh, to, or some trade-off on financial return to get social return. But the other way that this investment can happen, and that's been true in many of the investments that we've worked in, is to have uh, donors who basically take the risk that the, that the investor can't. So you still have that underlying dynamic of a bunch of willing parties getting together to find this. You don't have a dynamic where it's one, person, it's one person's money and someone else who's supposed to implement and carry it out. And there's this, this, uh, this uh, uh, discontinuity or this cognitive dissonance between the values of the giver and the values of the recipient. Everyone who comes into an, to an investment deal is seeking to get a return out of it. But the, 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 the fundamental difference is that you, you take some of the risk that the, the investor cannot bear, and you have development dollars underwrite that. Sometime that can be done through something like the, uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation or the development finance institutions, which statutorily are looking for a market rate return, but have a bit more patient capital than a lot of folks after there, out there. Otherwise, it can be done with grant dollars, like the uh, SME Challenge, the, the G8 SME Challenge that provided grant dollars to help buy down the risk. Uh, and sometimes it can be provided through things like the uh, challenge funds that the British government pioneered and now the Canadian government and the US government are, are doing. So I, I think I can stop there and just you know, highlight that that's one method to address this, this, this real challenge to aid effectiveness. And again, I think it's only one in many, but it's, it's, it is the fundamental challenge that has to be addressed to get the, to get the results that uh, the congressman's legislation uh, seeks to measure. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Sheila Hurling, you're the Vice President for Policy and Evaluation at Millennium Challenge Corporation. You've got over 20 years of experience leading on issues of aid effectiveness from a variety of roles. You were Deputy Director of Development Policy at the Treasury Department. You were uh, Director of the Rethinking Development Assistance Program at CGD. And um, we're very glad you're back in government. And uh, the you know MCC has a 10-year track record of implementing a development model based on aid effectiveness principles. Last year, you were you guys were ranked first among international donor agencies on the aid transparency index by publish what you fund. I think too often um, we spend a lot of time criticizing aid agencies for needing to do more. I think uh, MCC deserves a lot of credit for getting that recognition. I suspect you and your team have a lot to do with that. So congratulations. Um, can you talk about the lessons learned at MCC? MCC that can inform how we all think about having greater impact with fewer aid dollars and what is the impact that aid transparency can have on improving effectiveness? Yes. Thank you so much, Dan. And thanks for bringing forward this group of folks and this audience. Um, and a shout out as well to Congressman Poe for putting such an important um, issue into legislation and um, I'm hopeful for his success. Um, I guess let me just start with um, what I think about MCC. When I think about MCC, I really think about it as an agency that is testing this um, idea that foreign assistance should be treated like a business. And when you're talking about $50 billion a year spent by the US government alone, multilaterally and bilaterally, there's really no excuse um, for not having a business-like approach to that. And so as the Congressman said, um, yes, there's something to foreign assistance being defended as doing good, but there's something better defending it about doing good smartly. Uh, and so that is a lot of the principles that have been learned over the last 50 years by the entire international community um, that has been put into practice through the MCC. Um, and so what I can say about um, 
the biggest things we've learned and the biggest things we're trying to do in terms of putting a business-like approach to, to foreign assistance uh, is, is really three things. Um, use evidence at every single major decision point. It's not always going to be great, but it's best available. Bring it to the table to inform your decisions. Be transparent on everything. It, it just increases the impact of what you do. Um, evaluate, 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 to quote the congressman again. Um, and then fourth, make sure that you, when you take those lessons and learn those lessons, that you share them broadly um, and that you feed them back into your own business model and are constantly improving and adapting your business model. So from where the MCC sits, um, we've learned a lot about trying to bring those four things um, into practice. Uh, and they really are at every decision junction. So they are from the, very, from the very start of what is your mission, grounded in the evidence. So for the MCC, it's about if you're interested in poverty reduction, you have to accelerate growth. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, inclusive growth and growth period, but it really for us is about there will not be poverty reduction without growth. That is grounded in literature. Um, the second is deciding who you partner with. So as folks I think know, we have 20 indicators we look at across every single country. They are independent data sources not produced by us. Um, you either pass or fail a scorecard, and that helps ground the board's decisions on who you partner with. Then where do you invest? Um, and this, we, we do a whole bunch of economic analysis to decide where are the binding constraints to growth in a country. So if growth is your mission, understand what if you attacked and, re and removed a constraint to growth could accelerate growth in this country and thereby reduce poverty. So we have a whole bunch of analytics that we bring to the table, again, evidence, data, to decide where to go in the country. And then we demand a return. So very much like a business, we demand an economic rate of return of greater than 10% on our investments. And we do that by basically saying, for every dollar put you put in, you want to get at least a dollar out in increased household income in the beneficiaries that you're trying to help. And then evaluate. Um, and here for two reasons. The one that most people focus on and which even the congressman focused on, which is accountability. Accountability for taxpayer dollars, but accountability for sure for your partner countries and the citizens in your partner countries. Um, did you deliver what you promised? So that's the kind of pure audit type function of evaluation. What I would argue is and wish is that there was much more attention placed to the learning piece of evaluation. Um, learning about what works, learning about what doesn't work, um, because I can guarantee you we're all human. We learn much more from our failures than we do from our successes. They sting more, they stick more, uh, and therefore you don't want to do it again. You feed those things back in. Um, and so to have the courage to get out and talk about what doesn't work um, and have the space to do that, which we certainly have had the space to do that. So it's a good sign, um, as Ed and others were saying, of a, of a different uh, environment within which to operate. Um, and then in terms of just quickly what the administration is, is, is doing, um, you know, the congressman attacked the State Department and wonders what it's doing. Building this foreign assistance dashboard is not easy. It's not an excuse, but it is not easy. No administration has done this well, so it is a starting point. Um, it will take some work, and what is the State Department doing? Trying to get every agency's data good enough, comparable enough, um, get the basic mechanics down. It will include them um, over time, it will. We've got another year to, to put it all in there. Um, but also challenge each other by looking at who's doing it well and helping each other get there. There's also open government partnerships, so I, include you guys, I, I encourage you guys to, to focus on what's the U.S. open government partnership going to be. It's a big down payment on data, use of data, on transparency, um, so, so, I, so pay attention to that space. Uh, and then I think most of you are, are aware of the big focus uh, on evaluation and selectivity in the President's first ever policy uh, direct on development. So again, the core elements of a lot of the issues that are captured in the Poe Bill are also captured in this directive and guiding uh, the administration's efforts forwards. So why don't I stop there? Give just, time let me for, just, uh, just, Sheila, yeah. just taking advantage of, of your time, you just spend just another minute on how you think 
talk a little bit more about the Open Government Partnership as well as can you talk about the the IATI and publish what you fund stuff and how that's how you how that's impacting your your day job? Yes. So the Open Government Partnership from from the MCC will actually be our outward facing disclosure policy more or less. So um, very much a presumption of of transparency of publishing everything you possibly can, um, and I think other agencies will also be encouraged uh, to to do that. Uh, and so that will be the spirit within which we embrace the Open Government Partnership. Um, on IATI, um, yes, thank you for pointing out our number one ranking. It was really um, very, very hard earned um, and, and unexpected, really, when we looked at our, our competitors. Um, it really is a bit easier for the MCC. We are a small agency. We are a new agency. So we were built uh, in our DNA was this idea of using data, of having quality data, of being transparent. We, unlike almost every other US government agency, were not retrofitting. Um, we really weren't. We had a much easier play, a much easier starting ground from which to understand the mechanics of that rating and figure out how to organize our data accordingly. Um, much like our country ownership spirit as well, we want to have data that is, sure, accessible to us, um, accessible to the dashboard, but really accessible to the countries um, so that their citizens can look at where money that's coming into their countries is spent and what are they getting for it. Um, and so that really is uh, our incentive. But um, a lot of technical work, um, a lot more technical work than I ever would have thought uh, I would have had to understand. Uh, and so uh, hard, hard work went into it uh, and much harder work for other agencies. Thanks very much, Sheila. Porter, uh, thank you for being with us. You're a founding partner of the Kyle House Group. You had, uh, you've got over a decade of experience working on the Hill, including on foreign assistance and aid effectiveness in a number of ways. Uh, you were in a, you helped start the consensus on development reform, which I think both John Simon and I, I think, are both part of, uh, as well as you worked at the chamber, and you also um, have helped start something called ALGD that I hope you'll also talk about as well. But I suspect in this context, um, you know Congressman Poe quite well, and I think that um, I think that uh, you've also been very helpful to Congressman Poe and his team in helping. I think Luke Murray deserves a lot of the credit, but I think he also got some outside help from some folks, including yourself. And so um, talk a little bit about how um, the context of uh, where this bill is coming from. You talked to a lot of private sector actors. You talked to a lot of folks in government. You talked to a lot of folks in Washington. I think he tapped into a number of veins of, of, uh, of support. And I mean, 390 to zero, I think, speaks to it. But, Porter, uh, what's your what's your take on this? Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, pleasure to be with you, participate in this discussion. Uh, I will just focus, as you said, maybe a little bit more on kind of the legislative politics and the context and environment there. I think evaluating what Congressman Poe is doing and what he laid out in terms of the the challenges, but also the necessity for this type of legislation, it's helpful to understand it in a bit of a, a broader context in terms of what political environment created that bill, the bill came into. If, if you go back just the, the short term, and I think we've heard the efforts around reform surely go back much further, uh, particularly look, considering the fact that you haven't had a reauthorization of the Foreign Assistance Act since the mid-'80s. But in the more recent time, uh, in my own personal experience doing advocacy around foreign assistance, the 2000 and 2008 period really was a, a heyday you saw in terms of massive increases in funding, uh, new programs like the Millennium Challenge Corporation created, the big PEPFAR, HIV AIDS initiative, the President's Malaria Initiative. So it was a time that Congress had a, a very deep imprint um, working in a bipartisan way in terms of reshaping the focus and the resources and the role of U.S. foreign assistance in the world. But if you look over the last six years, so the beginning of the Obama administration, coming in during the 2008 financial crisis, much more limited budget environment, that's all had a major impact on our foreign assistance strategy, uh, the way Congress is engaged in this, and certainly a shift from a, a resource-driven to maybe a bit more of a efficiency-minded uh, approach to it. And I think Congressman Poe's bill should be understood, you know, also in terms of some bills that preceded it. And so you did have uh, an effort going back to 2009 with Congressman Howard Berman to really take on this challenge of rewriting the Foreign Assistance Act and trying to create uh, a more streamlined and accountable, uh, basically, authorization for these programs. One of the challenges you have with foreign assistance, absent an annual Foreign Assistance Act rewrite, 
or even a consistent State Department authorization is you don't have that same level of accountability and review and congressional engagement that you would on the Department of Defense with their National uh, Defense Authorization Act or other agencies. And so I think it, it creates more impetus than to, to look at measures like Congress imposed on monitoring evaluation and transparency. But the, the bigger, I mentioned the bigger bill in terms of the Foreign Assistance Act rewrite because unfortunately there really isn't at this time the political uh, energy to get something of that size, a 900 page bill through Congress and to get it done. So what you saw was then a more targeted approach to look at, well, what's the most important aspects of congressional oversight you need to see? And I think the monitoring evaluation, the transparency, which Congressman Poe decided to emphasize, really are important in the sense that you, you saw foreign assistance budgets from 2000, 2008, in some areas of the world tripling, increasing massively. Uh, so it's a logical conversation then in the, in the next phase to think about more performance measurement of those programs. And some newer programs like the Millennium Challenge Corporation and PEPFAR uh, were created at a time where we have newer methods to evaluate, as Sheila was explaining, but those don't necessarily translate across the 60 some odd departments, agencies, offices that do foreign assistance. Um, all of which you know, should be participating in this transparency dashboard initiative uh, over time. It's cumbersome. I think looking at it from the standpoint of the the, as, as Sheila appropriately says, the nature of the challenge is appropriate in terms of it takes time to get the state up there. I, I would see the purpose of the Congressman's legislation as somewhat different, which is not just to get it up there, but to make it something that's not at the discretion of a single administration, but to put it into law and make it a long-term requirement that this is how we do our foreign assistance. We report to Congress, we report to the American people in terms of where the resources are going uh, and, and distribute publicly the evaluation reports increasingly that are being developed by the MCC, by USAID. And so I think in that respect, it's not surprising, Dan, that you would see you know, 390 votes to zero. Who would be against you know, greater performance measurement of a much larger, although now static, foreign assistance budget? Um, and then similarly, you mentioned on the business side, you can look at it legislatively. There's also legislation, a, a bill called the Economic Growth and Development Act that was introduced in a bipartisan fashion in the last Congress, will be introduced again in this Congress. It takes more sort of the commercial perspective on how can the private sector better partner with U.S. development agencies. And MCC does this, and USA and other agencies, OPIC and Exxon Bank and others really exist really to do this in terms of looking at uh, using finance and risk mitigation tools to bring commercial partners into markets to promote development. And this Economic Growth and Development Act I think represents a, a greater engagement, Dan, that you've seen from the private sector of working together to try to find ways to utilize the smaller public sector investments, 9% of the overall pie of what's going into these least developed countries to help um, create a more transparent rule of law oriented environment where U.S. companies can play a larger role through their investments, through their operations to promote long-term development. So I just mentioned that as an area where I think you'll increasingly see Congress, when they, they can't just dole out big increases in funds, when they're thinking more about what to get out of these investments, the multilateral side of things, which you're more of an expert on than I am, Dan, I think you're going to see more and more interest on the private sector engaging Congress and Congress getting engaged with these multilateral development banks, international financial institutions to ensure that uh, it's serving broader U.S. interests and creating market conditions and investment conditions where our companies can compete. And I certainly would be someone who would advocate that that will lead to uh, development occurring more quickly in a more sustainable fashion. So I think all of those are elements that are at play in Congress now. The challenge of getting this bill done remains. You know, so for all who are, are here and represent different organizations, like this 390 to zero vote shouldn't create any sense that this is done. It, it wasn't passed in the last in the last Congress, even though there is a bipartisan bill in the Senate. Uh, there's much work to be done. That speaks to what Ed was talking about in terms of the current just nature of getting legislation through Congress and maybe some dysfunction, but it's probably the best opportunity that exists, this legislation, to really, uh, in a long-term way, carry forward some of these foreign assistance principles we're hearing about today. So I'll leave it there. Just, uh, just Porter, it, the, I think what I was saying earlier about having Ted Poe, who maybe not, may not come to this conversation from sort of a traditional development standpoint, was really important, and then constructively channeling his concerns and criticisms in a very constructive and positive and effective way. I think also this movement of the private sector that you've been a part of, of bringing to them, and we've been very happy at CSIS to be supporting that as well. Could you just spend 30 seconds explaining what is ALGD to this group? Sure. Um, and it really is truly an outgrowth of a, a project that Dan leads at CSIS, but the American Leadership and Global Development Coalition uh, is a coalition of U.S. corporate leaders, of large multinational corporations across sectors, but also inclusive of partners from the development community with the focus of looking at 
what are some of the policy issues that are either directly in the foreign assistance space or linked to it from trade and investment policy areas, uh, issues like development and, and export finance uh, authorities, issues like trade facilitation and trade preference reform, uh, infrastructure policy, all of which you can talk about in a development context or more of a commercial context because the linkages are very clear. But I think what it represents, Dan, is, again, companies you know, ranging from Chevron to GE to Land O'Lakes and across every sector trying to band together uh, and look at the role of global development policy from the U.S. government as more of an opportunity um, for them to look at their philanthropic endeavors, but also for them to advance their commercial interests. Yeah. I, think, I think having the private sector coming to this development conversation, like you said, changes the discussion similar to the way Ted Poe, by coming to this conversation, has helped bring, bring a, a positive conversation and bring a broader coalition to the table. Can I make so just one last yes, sir. point, which is that there was a, a comment that Congressman Poe made about... Um, you know, the cost of foreign assistance, I think it's, it's come up in context here, uh, and maybe even some pushback from the administration on costs. To, to do effective, you know, evaluation and, and, and monitoring of programs certainly comes with a financial cost. Uh, I think it's worth considering what is the alternative in terms of wasteful um, spending, and not just to say that these development programs wouldn't do good work on their own, but without evaluation, without the resources that are required, as an example, USAID's operating expenses account, you cannot do the type of valuation that Congressman Post is calling for. So I just think it's important to keep that. This isn't just about slashing budgets. It's about using resources to perform evaluation to approve performance. Let me, uh, uh, Greg Adams, you're director of aid effectiveness at Oxfam America. So you get up every morning and think about aid effectiveness. So this is, this is, I, I would, if it was me, I'd be saying I pay my mortgage on this stuff. You must pay your mortgage on this stuff. So this is, it's great to have you. You direct Oxfam, Oxfam America's advocacy work on aid effectiveness and reform of U.S. foreign aid and development policy. I think Oxfam America brings a very constructive um, perspective and a and a needed perspective to the conversation about uh, assistance and, and, and seeks to eliminate global poverty. So I'm really glad you're here. Thanks for being here, Greg. Thanks, Dan. And and just to be clear, because I do work for an NGO, I barely pay my. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, it's it's really great to be uh, a part of this panel and and here speaking to you all about this subject. Um, I think it's important to take a step back and remember what the central challenge here that we're all focused on. It's the fact that almost one in five people around the world are locked out of the current global economy, global, si global system of governance. And that creates a tremendous challenge to the security, the prosperity, and most importantly, the values of the United States. The American people get that. And this, is, this is what I think Congressman Poe is, is most channeling um, when he brings his, his energy to this topic. The American people get that, that this is a very real challenge. It's not that they question the challenge. They very much support the idea that the government of the United States should be focused on this challenge. They distrust that aid is the solution. And they're right. Aid is not the solution to poverty. People are the solution to poverty. Aid no more solves the poverty challenge than a shovel digs a ditch or a hammer builds a house. You ultimately need people picking up those tools, picking up the tool of aid, and using it to solve their development challenges. We're advocates for official development assistance at Oxfam, but only if it can be delivered in a way that actually supports the energies of people who are working to change their own societies. Too often as a community, we can find ourselves, I think, getting in our own way. And I think you guys have, have probably all experienced this. You're, I'm assuming you're here um, either because you've dedicated your life to, to working on this challenge um, or you're here to get out of the cold on a day like this. My guess is you're here because you're committed to the challenge. And you probably have a story like mine, my first story in development, which I want to try to share with you briefly. Um, I was 22 years old, 1995, dating myself a little bit, uh, as an election monitor in Haiti. 
and I was in a rural area in the north, and half midway through the afternoon, a report came in that there was a problem with the lists in Grand Riviere. So we hopped into the car, we rushed over there, I bull into the, the, uh, the, the voting place and, and start flipping through the lists up at the table and asking questions of the election judges and, and trying to figure out exactly what's going on. At some point, I can, I can just feel the top of my head burning and I look up. Everything in this busy election place, everyone had stopped and they were looking at me. They were looking at me, the one white face in this room and it dawned on me, oh my God, I'm now expected to fix whatever this challenge is, and I can't. And the next thought was even worse. It was, I don't even know that there's a problem here. And what if I just created one by coming in here and acting officiously in the midst of what could otherwise be a free and fair election? That stuck with me. The burden of that has stuck with me, and I'm sure many of you who have worked in the field have similar challenges like that. The fear that what we are doing is actually substituting our wisdom for the wisdom of people who live in these communities who are not sitting still. They're not sitting on their hands. They themselves are getting up every day trying to solve these challenges in their communities. The challenge for us here in the United States, here in Washington, is not how can we do it for them better. It's how can we listen to their wisdom and augment it with some of our own in a way that supports their efforts to do it better. I think the history of US engagement on global development is, is marked with examples of successes, most importantly, where we have stepped back and actively work to not substitute Washington wisdom for wisdom in the field, for the wisdom of the people who are actually fighting to change their own societies. That is the spirit in which Congressman Poe's bill is, is advanced and, to, and which makes it most so exciting to Oxfam. The idea that, for, that, that we've actually got energy here behind putting information about what the United States is doing actually in the hands of people in the field who can use it to change their own societies. Information about what we're doing in terms of where the aid is going and information about what's working and what's not working and what the obstacles are that they can use to drive change in their own societies. This has been the impetus behind the reforms of the Bush administration when the MCC was originally created, the reforms that the Obama administration has advanced in an effort to try to get more data out and try to have more decisions driven at the local level. And it's again, the thing that's driving Congressman Poe's bill. I wanna give you just a couple examples because I've gotten back in the last month from Ghana and Cambodia of how I, I, I'm hoping that this is gonna work in practice if we can get this bill passed and get more of this data out there. I had the chance in Ghana to meet with local government officials who are trying to advance agricultural development in their area in the north of Ghana. Too often the budgets that they get from Accra end up being fictional by the time the, the, the tasking orders actually get down to their level. How might greater transparency in US agricultural investments actually provide them a reference point to demand more accountability from their government. I had a chance to meet with some CSO officials in Cambodia who are very much concerned about the government's effort to, in the latest national development plan, define the role of civil society organizations only as service delivery vehicles, not actually as advocates to hold their government accountable. How might more information from the US government about what programs are working and what programs are not working actually strengthen their hand as, a, as an intellectual partner as opposed to just a service delivery partner for the Cambodian government. These are some of the ways that we can really advance not just prosperity and security, but our values through our development policy. And I'm really excited about Mr. Poe's effort to, to do this legislatively. I think it's one of the most powerful, actually democracy pieces of legislation we've seen in recent years. Uh, and we're really enthusiastic to be supporting it, so thanks.
Thanks a lot, Greg. Can I, I want to add a couple questions for the panel and then I'm going to open it up. I think it's really tremendous that at five o'clock we've got such a great crowd and I think it speaks to the fact that people are held by this, this compelling set of topics. Um, could, could, uh, I want to hear from Porter and from Ed about why is this, why is, is something that passes 390 to zero, why is this stopped? So Porter, Porter why don't I start with you, I'm going to start, then I'm going to ask Ed that question. Yeah, I mean, with this bill, I think specifically, Dan, I mean, there, there are a few pieces that have sort of been working at cross purposes with it. I, I think that the administration is, is very committed to their, um, to their policies on improving development, the president's policy directive, uh, specific agencies like the MCCs and their impact evaluations. I think they're like any other administration that would rather not have Congress mandating how they do these types of policies. And so there have been consistent, you know, points in the process where, the administration has has taken steps that have delayed, you know, moving this bill forward. And I, I don't mean that in an overly critical way, and, and, and certainly not in a partisan way. But that I think in order to get this bill to this final conclusion point, you know, there will need to be a final um, sort of coming to terms with the key agencies, the State Department in particular, uh, that this longer term um, objective needs to be achieved through statute. And and yet I wouldn't it wouldn't be fair just to point the finger solely at the administration. There have been challenges within Congress as well and within the leadership uh, and as Congressman Post said on the Senate side of those who will look at aspects like the scoring of a bill like this going back to the cost of actually implementing monitoring evaluation that need to be overcome in Congress. But with a vote of 390 to zero uh, and with more time now in this Congress than we had, th this bill showed up in the Senate, mind you, on December 30th, basically a legislative session was done. Um, there was no time to address any opposition to it at that point. Now you have time, and so I think you got to address these cost issues. You've got to ensure that the administration is on the same page. If those two issues can be achieved, there's no reason it can't get done. Okay, Ed, any other color commentary? I'm not the specifics on, on this. You may, I'm not going to ask you to say the specifics about this bill, but perhaps given what you've just heard from Porter, you just reflect a little bit more about why, why is it so hard, if it's 390 zero, I can't understand why this is so hard to get passed. Well, I think it reflects a little bit about the uh, diversity of opinion as to what foreign assistance is all about. The view from the Hill is, is fairly black and white for most members. They don't have the background or the experience. They haven't had the interaction. Some of them have, but most of them haven't. And so when you talk about foreign assistance, uh, it, it is something that uh, to them should be like an accounting practice. Every other program we have has this, so why don't we have this? Well, I look out in the audience here and I see a number of colleagues and a former AID and other development experts, and as I'm sure they can tell you, it's one thing to take a piece of paper and say, we want you to do X and give it to you, but it's quite another to actually have it work in a manner that makes sense, that is actually going to provide something useful at the end of the day, and the cost factors involved. Uh, I get a little upset when I see the reports come out from SEGAR and other places, the special inspector generals, not because I'm opposed to good governance and all that, but I know that the people that are doing these evaluations uh, perhaps do not understand that if you're going to build a school in Iowa, it's a little different than building a school in Afghanistan. And it's a little different on how you measure things. It's a little different on how you account for things. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it's not black and white. It isn't like a domestic program. You have to understand, most importantly, that the primary purpose of these programs is to support United States foreign policy and national security objectives. Sometimes those are not solely development objectives. They are much broader than that. And what this does is it drives the uh, bureaucracy nuts. The State Department opposes this, I understand that, because they're just saying, we don't have enough people, we don't have money to do what we're doing, and now you're gonna just throw this on top of us, and you're not gonna give us any guidelines, you're gonna make us develop this, and no matter what we do, it's not gonna satisfy the audience. So it's, it's a discussion that needs to be had with people on the Hill and the public in general, because I don't think we really have the same view of what these issues are all about. 
Okay, John and Sheila, you've been in uh, different government agencies and you've thought about measurement and evaluation and impact. Uh, uh, this bill talks about a 5% set aside for making allocations for resources. How to, how, from your ver the various past lives that you have or the current life that you have, how, how do the agencies that you've been in, how do they think about measurement and evaluation and how have they found the money for that? Because I think that, I think that may be one of the issues here that's, that's been raised is, okay, 5%, that seems like 5% of $50 billion, if you, whatever the number is, that's a quote unquote a lot of money. How, how, do, how do different uh, agencies think about this? So maybe, Sheila, I'll start with you, if you would, because I obviously you, you're doing this for, for a day job right now. <laughs> sure. Um, well, for the MCC, we spend on average about 4% of our compacts on monitoring and evaluation. Our compacts are typically 350 to $700 million. So it's a, it's a substantial amount. Um, and I think it, it So this is a good opportunity. If you're a development consultant, they should be coming to you now and <laughs> It's be, true. Right? I mean, 100% of our, of our evaluations are independent. They are not ours. So yes, there is an industry around this for sure. Um, but it's an industry that, uh, as Ed was saying, does understand the business of development. I'll take a little bit of issue with um, it's so different than, than regular evaluation. I don't think it is. It's a, it's a discipline. It's a practice. Um, but knowing your client, and in particular, which is what everybody doesn't spend enough time on, really spending the time to uh, work through your program logic, your program design, your evaluations are only as good as your program designs. And too often in the aid business, the program designs are rushed um, for, for for many reasons, um, but the program designs are rushed. You think you can figure it out later, and then a lot of attention on the evaluation, which frankly just can come out and tell you uh, you didn't have a good program logic. So therefore, did you achieve the results you set out to? Um, maybe, mixed, or we don't know yet. Um, so uh, part related to that is the experience of having patience. So Congressman Poe referred to, um, it sounded a bit of frustration on the time it's taken to, for even agencies like the MCC where it's been embedded in, in, in how we do business to get out the impact evaluations. Um, so there's the cost side of it, there's the time side of it um, to do them right, and there's also, um, really importantly, the timing piece of it, which is do not do evaluations and rush them when you really, if you're measuring impact, um, you have to give it a couple years before you evaluate it so that you can see whether your program made any difference. Um, in particular, if your end game is uh, increased household incomes, um, that's a little bit down the road. So one of the biggest lessons that we're learning from the the first round of our impact evaluations coming out is a lot of them are going to say, we don't know yet. Why? Because you did your evaluation too early. Why do we do our evaluation too early? Because we're getting pressure from Congress, from ourselves, from others to get that stuff out there. That stuff out there for accountability, not for learning. Um, so back to my point on please, can we start emphasizing the learning piece of this, which is what I think we all um, should, be, should be much more focused on, because that in some respects will enhance the accountability side. I'm just, Sheila, let me, this may not be totally a fair question for you, but my sense is that the way MCC is funded, it may be easier for MCC to set aside money for m and &E than, say, AID, where I'm going to get into the weeds here, but there's different accounts. There's something called operating expense at AID, and there's something called program funding. Not clear to me where you go for, for measurement and evaluation monies at AID. I don't think MCC is set up that way. And I think Gary Edson and others, when they were designing this, said, we're going to do an end run around some of these, this thicket of problems that aid and some of the other traditional aid agencies in the US government have to deal with. So to some extent, do you have, are you blessed by that and are able to kind of dodge this, this broader question of, of uh, finding the monies for this that maybe other agencies don't have that, have that luxury? I think so. I mean, we embed, we, we certainly, Gary Edson and others did learn from the experience uh, of USAID, who I know would love to change the way that, that, uh, that they're constructed, because it does stand in the way of doing due diligence, right? Um, and so, yes, the MCC was constructed in a way that program funding can fund m and &E. But we also do a whole lot of funding of, of uh, due diligence, including the in setting up the results frameworks um, through our own administrative budget. And so, um, so you need to do a little bit of both. John, you were at AID and you were at OPIC and you thought a lot about this. Talk about, talk about how, how those different agencies think about, think about impact and evaluation. Uh, there are a number of strands that have just been mentioned that I think are worth addressing before I get into sort of the way we focused at, at OPIC and why I think, there, again, there's a fundamental difference between the way you do uh, evaluation and measure impact in um, 
aid programs versus investment programs. But first off, to resolve perhaps this burgeoning uh, uh, dispute between Sheila and Ed on how easy it is to do um, impact evaluation in the field. Uh, I think Sheila's right that doing the actual evaluation of counting and seeing what actually happened, I mean, that can be done. The challenge is understanding the context which, with it, with, uh, uh, which people are operating in that circumstance. So I remember one of the first cigar criticisms of the uh, Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq was that they took bags of money to the ministries and they handed out bags of money to people to pay them. Um, and it wasn't this horrible. Where was the accountability for that? Uh, in that context, that was probably the best thing you could do. They identified who got the bags of money, that everyone knew that person was, and if people didn't get paid, they knew who to blame. And that people in that environment, that was a great accountability um, metric. Um, it, and, and so I think, you know, it's not that it's tough to, to, to measure, but it, you, you have to somehow infuse into this uh, the, uh, the, the context. Uh, another aspect that I want to build on, though, in terms of what I'd said before I get to the, 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 the difference between um, measuring impact and investment and aid, is this fact that when you look at um, <laughs> foreign aid, the objectives of the different pockets of money are not as clearly articulated as they should be. Um, and so we have money that goes to places not for development purposes, but purely for political purposes. We have money that goes to places purely to keep people alive, irregardless of whether they're, you know, that, that, that they're in an environment that has good governance or bad governance. And then we have money like the MCC money that is very much tied to helping to improve the, the, the economic and governance policies that are there. We do not explain that clearly to the world. So if you evaluate money that was designed to help support a political ally, um, or money that was designed to help people keep them alive, by the same metric that you're measuring the MCC, you're gonna come up with a very different result than what's there. And part of what, I mean, Ed referenced that we tried a bit of this foreign aid reform of moving boxes and we're gonna have a grand scheme and then it boiled down to a very small scheme that still was heavily criticized. Some of you may know this as the F process. <laughs> but part of what was behind yeah. <laughs> yeah. But part of what was behind that was this idea, and I believe this should happen and, and the and the State Department should not be afraid of this, of trying to be clear about what you're trying to accomplish with your dollars. And rather than waiting for Congress to sort of impose that on you, as a bureaucracy say, here's the money that is gonna go for this, and we're gonna have clear metrics about whether we accomplish that or that. I mean, this is what the MCC can do, but very little of the rest of government can do. Here's the money that can go for that, and we have clear metrics for that. And at some level, try and tie together. If we can keep people alive in this country today, maybe tomorrow we can start thinking about what we do about building the seeds of democracy. And if we can keep this country in our column as an ally today, maybe tomorrow we can talk about political reform and being clear about that. Unfortunately, um, there's a real aversion within the bureaucracy to being as clear about that. And I think ultimately it's self-defeating. Um, and, and, and one last, last point on this sort of issue with the resources to measure aid. No business would operate itself by saying, I have a limited number of dollars to do m monitoring, to do uh, uh, results reporting, to do um, uh, 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 the administrative functions. They'll say, what's the most effective way to do those things? And that's how much they cost, and that's what I should allocate. The split between program and OE is lunacy, and yet it really hinders the ability to do uh, aid effectiveness. And I guess this gets down to the point about why I think monitoring in aid programs and investment programs are fundamentally different. Um, we had a very hard number when we were at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation about whether a program was basically successful. We could look at its profit and loss. The things we funded were businesses that had P&Ls. They weren't all for-profit businesses. Some of them were NGOs. Some of them were for-profit businesses. But they all had a P&L. We made investments that had to be paid back. And we, we could, in the first instance, is the money being paid back? If no, we have a problem. If yes, how's the business performing? If yes there, then what's happening with the development, development impact? And you have a 16-point matrix that looked at a whole series of things, how the workers were treated, how many jobs were created, whether there was technology transfer, what was the environmental impact, to see what was happening. Now, I would argue that was too many metrics. I'd like to know the two or three things that this business was going to accomplish that would make a real difference in development and focus on those. And ideally, in an impact investment, 
Those things are fundamental to the success of the business. So you know if the business is succeeding, they're delivering health care to poor people, or they're delivering education, or they're solving a fundamental infrastructure problem. If the business is failing, then those things probably aren't happening. And again, that's why, in my mind, one of the ways that you solve this principal agent problem in development, um, I mean, where you, where you, one way is to have clear, transparent data, like the MCC does. The other way is to have the incentives aligned so the people implementing you know, are, are, you know, if they need to, to deliver more health care to make the profit to fund their own salaries and, and, and what they're going to do. And that's where the difference comes in, in terms of my mind, in, in, in metrics between investment and aid. Okay, so Greg, I want you to talk about this, this question about measurement evaluation, but I wanted to hear from you, I want to hear from Porter, and I want to hear from Ed on the question of the a Foreign Assistance Act rewrite. Do we need such a thing? So jump jump in a, a two finger on this issue of M&E right. that Sheila and John have been talking about. Well, and I then just, I want you to, to answer that question about do we need one and why? Right. Um, great, thanks. And I, I, I do just want to emphasize something that, that John said that was really important. Um, it's impossible to get a meaningful evaluation result of a program if you're lying to yourself about what you're trying to accomplish. And we do this too often in the United States government. We're not clear on what we're either, either intentionally or unintentionally unclear about what we're actually trying to accomplish. There's been some great work on this showing how this actually damages America abroad. Uh, I think the most powerful stuff has been done by the Feinstein Center out of Tufts. Michael Kleinman had a report a few years ago. Many of you probably remember it. The money quote from that report was from a gentleman along the coast of Kenya outside of Mombasa who was quoted as saying, the most powerful country in the world comes halfway around the planet to repair, not build, but to repair a latrine, and they and they think that we don't expect that they want anything in return, do they think we're stupid? To, the, to, to every person around the globe, it's very transparent when we are taking a political or security purpose with our assistance. Now, Oxfam does not argue in favor of aid for political purposes. We argue in favor of aid, politically sophisticated aid, to fight the challenge of poverty. But let's be realistic. The United States does have an array of interests. Let's just be honest about every dollar we're spending and what standard it should be measured against when we measure it. Shifting the Foreign Assistance Act rewrite. This, for me, is the most powerful reason why you do need to do this, this thorough rewrite of the Foreign Assistance Act. And it's to be clear and honest across this town, at least, as to what it is we are trying to accomplish with our development programs. That is so confused at this point. We get you know, a few moments of clarity on this, but we're still lacking this real political consensus about what the few aims of our development programming should be. That's the real, that's the real need for the Foreign Assistance Act rewrite. It's not simply to clean up the U.S. code. Um, the, you know, for me, the, some of the most pernicious words in Washington are, my general counsel tells me I have all the authorities I need. Of course State Department has the authorities to pursue any strategy they want. Of course USAID has the authorities to pursue almost any strategy they want. It's not about what the law lets you do. It's about what Congress and the American taxpayer trusts you to do. And that, for me, is the fundamental missing piece of the failure to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act, or at least get some, some new uh, authorizing language that would clarify the purpose of our development programs. Porter. I'm sort of torn in answering that, because I think on the one hand, you absolutely need it to have the type of oversight and to ensure that the strategy from Congress's perspective that's guiding our foreign assistance is up to date and reflects you know, changing dynamics on the ground in the world and priorities for the US. Uh, on the other hand, I think politically, it's, it's such a challenge. And so what do you do when you know you need it, but you may not be able to have it in the near term? And I think that bills like Congress imposed bill, but working the State Department authorization through Congress on a regular basis, which ends up leading to conversations about other programs, uh, all can sort of move it towards the right direction. I mean, the fact that the William Challenge Corporation, great agency, was 
authorized originally through an appropriations bill speaks to this broken process in the sense that sort of authority should not rest within the appropriators as much as I've got many friends and appreciate what they do and, and, and they have an important role to play. They shouldn't be making all the decisions and they're not designed to perform the proper oversight. Uh, the, I mean, think about a parallel, Dan, of, you know, if, if the last time the National Defense Authorization Act had been passed was 1986, that would essentially mean Congress hadn't cared about what the Pentagon was doing since 1986. Um, and that's exactly what you're dealing with here is basically a number of administrations um, conducting our foreign assistance without clear regular guidance from the U.S. Congress. Okay, Ed. So why you were you were around for the last you, as a child now. prodigy? You were around. You were involved with the 1986. You, you were a day, you were a child prodigy at the time, uh, and you were uh, at, you were at the State Department, if I recall correctly, in terms of when that last partial rewrite was done in 1986. Talk about do we need one? And talk about why why is that hard to do, and how it relates to this conversation. Thank you. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I was uh, leading the effort from the State Department on that legislation. I didn't realize that it would be the last time they would do a comprehensive <laughs> authorization bill, but uh, it was. And uh, uh, yes, I think we need uh, a reauthorization. We probably need an entire rewrite because the whole fundamental basis of the act in 1961, which is what we're working off of, has little relevance to the world we have today. But the problem isn't with the community. I think everybody in the community would like to see that. I don't know whether we can agree on what that is. But the problem is the process. Uh, and I'm very pessimistic about the process producing a good document uh, or even being able to get very far just because uh, of things that have nothing to do with foreign assistance but have to do with the uh, fundamental challenges that are going on in the Hill right now. Uh, it, it ought to be noted that uh, I think the defense authorization bill is the only authorization bill that has continuously been made through this because there's a constituency there. Once again, I mentioned that fact, uh, and that constituency has been very tough, too, to, to keep that going. Um, we are making some progress outside. We're finding other ways. The QDDR of a couple of years ago uh, was a big step in that direction. We're beginning to reevaluate uh, uh, internally how those things happen. The Defense Department had to do that. Started with the uh, Defense Authorization Act in 47 or something like that, which created the Defense Department. And then Goldwater Nichols uh, a little later in the 80s, after they figured out that things weren't working well. Well, we haven't had that. It's not only a Foreign Assistance Act which governs the um, programs, but we also need a State Department Reauthorization Act. Let's not forget that USAID was founded uh, by John Kennedy because there was a proliferation of parts of the U.S. government doing all kinds of things uncoordinated uh, coming out of World War II. Uh, all of the Marshall Plan and all the other stuff was going on, and he pulled it all together and said we needed to have a coordinated vision for going forward, and that's USAID. So almost every day since USAID was, was created, we've now seen a proliferation of everybody who wants to play in the pool. And if I recall correctly, there were four agencies at the time, and he thought that was too many. I think there's now 21, <laughs> yeah, or something like that. It's, it's, it's maybe utterly, 60. utterly ridiculous. I remember um, when MCC was being debated, uh, and, and we had, even before that, we had poor uh, Secretary Rice had to go to the Hill, and somebody asked her, how much money do you have in your democracy programs? And she couldn't answer the question because she didn't own all the democracy programs. They were democracy programs going on here, there, and everywhere. And that's not unique. Sadly, it has gotten to the point where we don't have fundamental vision and guidance at the top, and we don't have coordination that allows these things. And I think that terribly affects effectiveness, and I know it affects the Congress's view of whether this is a worthwhile program. That's why. It's so easy and matter of fact to slam foreign aid because it doesn't have a constituency, it doesn't really affect as many people in the United States, and therefore, um, I, when I started in this, uh, there were members of Congress who said, you know, 
I don't even have a passport, and they were proud of that. Or they said, I've never voted for a foreign aid bill in my life, and I never will. I would get defeated. Well, fortunately, I think we've moved a little bit from there, whether it's the global economy that has come home to roost or whether it's other factors, but we have to find a way to do it. I'm just not encouraged that it's going to be on the higher list uh, of this administration or any administration. I'm afraid the Congress is going to first have to figure out a way for it to uh, reform itself a little bit, not foreign aid, but just in general, the way that it approaches authorizations uh, in general. All right, I want to open it up. You've all been very patient. Thank you very much. Uh, and I've got, I want to take some questions. So I see this woman here. We're going to do this World Bank style. I'm going to put the two or three questions together. This woman here, and let's see, anybody else? And this gentleman here. We'll start, and this woman here. So these three, this woman, this woman, and this gentleman, these three. Okay. And we'll get them all as a bunch, and then we'll give the panels a chance to, so name, where you're from, short question or comment. Great. All right. I'm Sally Paxton. I'm the U.S. representative to publish what you fund and want to thank you for putting this panel together. And Glad I called on you. <laughs> obviously want to echo Congressman Poe's call for more transparency and to know where the money goes. Um, Sheila, in her comments, discussed both the effort and the reason that MCC put such a premium on quality data, publishing data, and earned a very well-deserved number one ranking from, from us. Um, one of the questions that we hear very frequently, and it's often from people who are charged with coming up with the, the data that needs to be published, is, is there really a demand for this information, for this kind of detailed quality data? Is there a demand for it? Who is using this data? Um, and so I would, I would be interested in hearing Sheila and others' perspectives on the demand for quality information. Is there a demand at the country level? Is there a demand by the private sector? Um, who else is demanding this information? And how do we go about um, both identifying the demand and making sure that we increase the demand so that we can all have better decision making? Great. And this, this woman here at, uh, with the blue sweater or blue jacket. Hi, I'm Julia Marvin from the US Global Leadership Coalition. Um, I heard a mention of the QDDR, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more on that in terms of the future role, if there would be any um, in the effort to you know, increase transparency and evaluation efforts. And the gentleman behind her. Hi, I'm Stephen Donaghy, uh, born in Northern Ireland, has been working on the ground in Africa on democracy and human rights projects for a while. Um, my experience is that in very politically conflicted and post-conflict situations, aid effectiveness is really hard to, to establish and to understand. You know, I think it comes down to some of this idea about the political will behind what you're going to do. If you wrote a plan for the Northern Irish peace process that took 15 years and five presidential visits, it wouldn't get anywhere. But that's what it took to get done. To do the stuff on the ground, and the, I think Sheila's point is really good about evaluation being about what you learn to do. But if we publish that, that puts, if we were accountable about what happened, the people on the ground would be in danger. The, uh, they, they, they would allow the government to counteract what we're trying to do. And you know, this is in the human rights and democracy building. And so I think you need to be very careful about the political context in which you publish, publish information. Because it's one stage what you're going to do is give your opponents just simply sticks to, beat your, to, to break your back with. You know, if you publish, if you publish what's happened or what has what hasn't worked, yeah. somebody in Iowa will say it was common sense that that wouldn't work. It's not common sense in another area, and so the context of the information in which we publish is as important as the information that we publish. Thank you. Uh, I want to come back to. That. I think that's a very interesting and nuanced point. I think it's an interesting one. I think that we we should address in this conversation. So let me. So is there a demand for this data? I would like Sheila, Greg, and Porter to t answer that question. The QDDR and its future role. I'm hoping both Ed and John could take that on. And then I want to take on this question of this issue of, okay, data and transparency is good in a lot of contexts, but how about when we're giving money to Iranian dissidents, and I hope we are, uh, or giving money to, um, you know, undermine the bad guys in, in other parts of the world. And so it's a great idea to, to put that data out there, but then, you know, if, if, if we're giving some money to the good guys and they get, you know, they get disappeared in the middle of the night because of that, is that, is that such a good thing? So, 
the sort of like, is there too, can there be too much transparency in some context? Not all, but in some, right? I think so. I'll, I'm going to make that an open question for the end, but let's start first with, is there a demand for, and who's using the data? Sheila, Greg, and Porter. Start with you, Sheila. So thank you, and thank you, Sally, for your hard work and everything that you do. I love, I love your index, not just because we were rated number one. I loved it before then. <laughs> Um, kiss you. <laughs> that's right. Um, is there a demand for the data? Um, there is certainly a demand for the data within the MCC. Um, it was an incredible inspiration for us to organize our own data. So at your comment about Secretary Rice not being able to answer how much do we spend on democracy, um, it was still even hard for us actually to pull that information together. And so, and we started with this, right? So, so it was when you're building something and flying it at the same time, these are always the things you don't you don't focus on first. We were young enough to be able to group it in and, and increase the quality of our data and put dedicate resources to, to an organizational structure of data that we thought made sense. Um, and so there's certainly an internal, uh, very internal demand for the data. There's also an interagency demand for the data. Um, and so you'll see that through the foreign dashboard. You don't see a lot of this, but in through the foreign dashboard exercise, there is a lot of learning that is going on on how to do this, what it requires to do this, and how to improve the quality of your data. And we are helping others get there, um, just as State Department is. And so there is certainly a demand within the interagency for the data. Um, there's also been an interesting demand from the private sector for the data, um, particularly groups like KPMG and others who do country risk assessments um, for their clients. Um, they have their own indices. They were looking to us for how we do our, our country scorecard, which is in some respects a, an integrity screen or a risk uh, measurement screen. And so they were looking to um, our data on how can we use it. If you make it public, we're going to grab it. And if you make it machine readable in particular, we're really going to grab it. And so there was a lot of demand um, from the private sector, which we keep uh, uh, getting. Uh, and then from the country, uh, from the country, I mean, to be honest, this is something that I sort of am giggling that Sally asked me because I'm always asking her. Um, for me, the biggest client that, that I want for this data is the countries themselves. And to be quite honest, there's not enough of it. Um, and it needs to, that demand has got to be there to keep agencies like ours and others focusing resources there. Uh, and so we have some good examples. Honduras, for example, is a, is a great, uh, it's an interesting country that is, has a real open government uh, approach right now. And so they've done a lot of open budgeting. They are publishing a lot, of, uh, a lot of information in the government. And they actually have been partnering with us on how to use the data and how to visualize the data. So if it's machine readable, you can you do a lot with visualization that just makes it more accessible. I um, mean, so they have been a standard out um, partner for, for me in this sense. But to be quite honest, um, it's not huge, and it needs to be. OK. Uh, Greg. Yeah, on, on that point. Just push the button, sorry. I thought it. Just p picking up on, on where Sheila left off, and, and you know, we, we also have been watching the Honduras example as, as, as a great one. Um, but I don't, I, I think we need to be patient that supply of data does not immediately create its own demand. There is definitely demand out there. Um, but this is not magically going to going to uh, transform development in the in in the time it takes to to give a handshake or download um, a, a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, the data is most useful in context. And so until there's a certain critical mass of data out there, so that a lot of the partners that we work with can actually use it to actually influence changes in policy and demand accountability, we're, we're going to see slow uptake, we think, on this. We see examples where we've got partners and allies around the world who are already using the data they have um, to try to engage in accountability efforts. But as long as that data continues to be as sparse as it currently is, we're, we're, we're going to be looking at a slow build on this. So I think we need, to, we need to keep doing what we're doing. We need to keep talking and listening about how the data is being used. Um, but I don't, I, 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 th I think the transparency movement is coming of age in that we are getting over the magical idea that transparency will automatically and immediately lead to accountability. You first need people to be able to use that data to demand accountability. They've got to have the capacity not just to understand it, but to parse it for their own use and to actually employ it as a tool. Um, and that's going to take a little while longer in a lot of contexts to really, 
develop. On the question of safety, um, of and is, is, there, is there such a thing as too much transparency? Absolutely. Um, we've heard, uh, in, in particular, I remember somebody telling me an anecdote from Columbia where you had um, certain uh, certain private sector voices who were demanding more transparency about um, some uh, union efforts, U.S.-supported union efforts in Colombia. They were basically trying to target union organizers using that information. Uh, so there is definitely a, a risk at the far end of the spectrum that you could provide too much data. That said, in most contexts, we are so far away from that <laughs> at this point. Um, that there's, there's a lot that we can do to provide additional useful data while still, I think, steering clear of those danger points. We do absolutely need to take care. And it comes, again, I think, from building this policy around the idea of who is the end user and how do we give them what they need. If that is your North Star, I think we're a lot safer and we, we, we've got to check on running the risk of disclosing information that could actually put a citizen or an activist actually in danger um, on the receiving end. And just a quick word on the QDDR, because I think that last process was a disappointment in many ways, or two ways specifically. The first was it was so overly focused on moving the boxes around on the org chart. Washington loves an org chart. And if there had been, I think, more energy on strategy and priority setting within that process, um, it, it could have yielded a more useful product. The other, the other part of that is that Congress was not effectively involved in that. That could have been an opportunity to get closer to this political grand bargain that could really build a consensus about what we were trying to achieve um, with our uh, with our diplomacy and um, and development programs, uh, but it was all done in house, uh, and I think there's a chance with this process to take a different approach. It's still not too late, and I hope that much like the QDR, which it was modeled on, which is which has a direct line of connection to defense authorizations and defense appropriations. There's a chance to, to mesh the teeth on this and really make those gears work together. Thanks, Greg. Okay, Porter. Um, just very briefly, in terms of the need for information, we talked about a lot of different consumers and customers of that. I think going back to where you started your event today with Congressman Poe and what Congress's needs are as it relates to data and information, it's probably a, a sort of, of data that's far less technical in many respects. But if you consider the what we discussed about the budget environment, a flat budget environment, any increases in one foreign assistance account are going to come at the expense of another. I mean, this is when Congress more than ever needs uh, real-time effective data on performance. And so I know that looks different across different types of programs, and there may be examples. There's a question on you know, conflict zones and how do you evaluate performance in the near term. But the practical reality is that Congress budgets every year. It has to make these decisions whether or not the information is perfect. And if there can be more um, readily available and constructive data to them. And I, and I just make one Last point on the piggyback on the QDDR point. I mean, the QDR, remember, this goes back to our authorization issue of, of foreign assistance, and the State Department said that the QDR was created by Congress. It was authorized through a National Defense Authorization Act. Congress exerts great will over the QDR in terms of mandating what it includes, uh, the regularity of it. You know, the QDDR, to the credit of the administration, was created by the executive branch. As Greg said, without that connection back to statutory authority and oversight over it, its use is limited, in my view. Okay, John, and then Ed. Yeah, well, first on uh, the question of the QDDR, um, I, I, I actually take a somewhat different view. And if you take what Ed said about the likelihood of a foreign aid authorization bill and likelihood of anything in Congress, I think the onus shifts to the administration to heal itself uh, and to to start to set. A, a clear, coherent strategy in place, and as um, Greg said earlier, not to lie to itself and be as clear as possible. And I think a QDDR process 
is one of the ways that you could potentially do that. Now, the ultimate product had its deficiencies, but I think if you sort of read through the bureaucraties, you do find some sense of priority sense setting. Some, you know, you have to read closely. It's like, uh, you know, Kremlin watchers who have to, you know, read and, but you, you realize that some words were chosen and some words weren't. I mean, it's the same thing you do with a national security strategy. National security strategy has to be read you know, with a sort of translation thing right by and say, ah, oh, that means that. And oh, let's look at the last one and see that they changed this word to that word. And so that means that. I mean, it's not the best way to, to be, to, to get the clarity we want, but it's a start. And I do think over time, if you start this process, it will put pressure on the appropriators to react and just to, to, to respond and say, you laid out a coherent plan or a, you, you said these things, did you actually, and this is where Poe's bill you know, Congressman Poe's bill really comes into, 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 into play. You said you'd do this. This is what our evaluation show what you did. Why the differential? What happened there? So I do think it's, 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 a, it's a good first step, and I think it's a very much of a baby step, and certainly there's a lot with the ultimate product to, to, uh, to be unhappy with, but I think it, it starts. To the point about um, you use information that can ultimately... Uh, redound to the to the detriment of people in the field. I think there are two different questions here. There's a question of do you collect and analyze the data, and then do you disclose? Uh, and um, classification is now a subject that's not in vogue, and there's movements afoot that says we should be declassifying everything. And I think this is a classic example why that's not the case. Um, the government does classify a lot of things. A lot, obviously, it shouldn't classify. But I think you know we can make a reasonable judgment that. Once we have the data, does, are there negative effects if we disclose this or not? And if there are, you know, there, there are people empowered within government to, to, to not do that. I think, but I think the important part about this is we don't want to get, be in that situation. I, I mean, Greg, I think you had it exactly right. We cannot be lying to ourselves. And the only way you don't lie to yourselves is, is if you, you, you look at the, what's really happening and foot it with what you, what you were, were hoping to happen. So I do think it's a real concern. I think there are lots of situations where you have to be careful about disclosure, but that doesn't mean you don't get the data to begin with. But if I could yes, just on please. that point, it's about, I mean, there's the disclosure point, but then there's also a whole process for anonymizing data, right? And so, for example, we have a disclosure review board, which will take all of the data, and there's so much data from baselines, midline, and endline surveys, and anonymize it so you are protecting the identity, most certainly of your human subjects, um, before you release it. You still release it, um, and the data can still be hugely important for others outside to independently verify your results. Um, but you are protecting individuals who could most certainly be at harm for, or just in, you know, just in the way of governments wanting to get more taxes, right, or, or something like that. So not harm, harm, but uh, unduly targeted. And so there's a process for doing that, which is, which is one step better than not disclosing. Ed, I'm going to ask you to uh, comment on the QDR, and then I want Sheila, you're going to have the last word. So, Ed. Uh, thank you. All three questions, I think, actually come together in a way that I want to make my comment about the QDR, and that is the question of is there a demand for the data, and um, what's the QDR, and what uh, the, the last question of the gentleman back there, how difficult it is. I think we have to constantly remind ourselves and remind others that this thing is made up of a whole bunch of separate parts which are different from each other. So that what you do in the humanitarian area is so much different than what you do in the development area. What you do in the political area is different. So that uh, data sharing may make sense to people in the field or it may make sense to other people who wish to use it in some way or form, but the reason you're going to do it is because the Congress wants you to provide this information so they can justify what you're doing. And sometimes we get lost, I think, when we get involved in one of these avenues of the programs and believe that it's our mission to save the world. It is not our mission to save the world. The mission of all of this is to support the United States foreign policy and national security interests. John Kennedy said that helping other countries develop is in our national security interest because if they don't do that, then we have wars and then we have man-made disasters and famines. So it is in our interest, but let's not lose sight of the fact that the American public does four or five times more 
in transferring wealth to the developing world outside of government than we do in government. So the limited amount of resources we have in government have to be viewed in the context of what they're designed for. Remittances, colleges, universities, foundations, private giving is way, way more important. 20, 30 years ago, it used to be that 80% of the aid flow or the dollar flows to the, con uh, to the developing world came from official sources. Today, only 20% come from official even sources, less. or even less. So let's keep in mind what we're looking at and why, and I do think that QDDR is a great first step. It didn't accomplish everything. They're not even implementing everything that they thought ought to be done, but at least you got them for the first time to start this discussion. What kind of an apparatus do we need and what is its purposes and what are its goals? And you cannot leave the Congress out of that. That is their job. They're supposed to tell the State Department and AID what they want achieved and then state will go and do it, not the other way around. And I think this balance needs to be readjusted. Sheila, you have the last word. Um, I guess if I could just summarize a few things from this great panel, Dan, thanks for putting together such a, a good group and thank you guys for staying so long. Um, you know, I guess the first is to make sure that you have a vision and, and, I, and, I, and I hope that this administration has proven that there is a vision in this development space and in particularly in the transparency and evaluation space. Um, and so look at the president's policy uh, directive on development. Look at the QDDR for all of its warts. I do uh, align myself a lot with what Ed said on it's a start. It was a first. It's quadrennial for a reason. We're in year four. Um, so, uh, you know, again, remember, just like with the Defense Department, this hopefully is something that is repeated uh, and that there are lessons learned um, from the first time. Um, look at the open government partnership. Again, a big down payment on that space. Look at the executive orders on open data and evaluation. These are all things that, yes, the executive branch is doing. Hopefully, there will be a time when there is greater partnership with Congress. I agree. It would be ideal to get there. Um, the second is, uh, for whatever program you're doing, make sure you have a definition for impact. It doesn't have to be the same. MCCs is household income. Um, it takes a long time to get there. It doesn't have to be everybody's definition of impact, but know what your definition of impact is and set out to monitor it. So create very careful measurement tools to define your inputs, to get to your outputs, to get to your outcomes, to get to your impact. That is what I meant earlier when I said to Ed, it's not different. It's a discipline to get there. You can have different definitions of impact, but the model to evaluate it is a model that people know. So, so assign the measures. Um, something John said, make sure you measure what matters. Just measure what matters. Um, not 150 things that take up a lot of time to measure that actually are never used. Measure what matters um, and publish it. So get it out in the public domain, anonymize the data so you're protecting human, human individuals, um, but get it out there and have an aggressive outreach strategy for learning for yourself, but learning for others, and we hopefully just continuously leapfrog and enhance this space. Please join me in thanking the panel.